two teenage lovers run away together in search of freedom and adventure. He loved her a lot. He had asked her to marry him. He treated her very well. Wanted to like protect her from everything. The young girl's anxious parents report their daughter missing, but are they too late? They were gonna flee the state. Then we started really getting concerned. The couple's friends are in no hurry to help the police find them. The one thing we always did was we always backed each other's play. They never thought this adventure was going to end up the way it did. The young man found brutally bludgeoned to death along a railway track. It looked like somebody had just been brutally beaten about the head. The 16-year-old girlfriend vanished without a trace. Who did this? If she was with someone else, this would be against her will. My biggest fear for her at this point is that she is dead. County, smack in the middle of Florida, is a land of horse ranches, small towns, and trains. Lots of trains. Many of the freight cars traveling these tracks are full of orange juice from the fertile Sunshine State. But it's along these tracks that a train crew makes a grisly discovery. Marion County Sheriff's Captain Patty Lumpkin is on call that day. When we got there, we see the body of what appears to be a young male, maybe in his late teens, early 20s, blood around the head area. You could tell by looking at him that he was dead. And the first thing I do is make sure that we've got our forensics people on the way, our medical examiner on the way, and all of the investigators that we have called out are either there or en route. Lieutenant Jeff Owens is one of those officers. When those type of things happen, it could be someone who might have fallen off a train or someone who could have been struck by a train. But on closer inspection... It didn't appear to be an accident because if he had been hit by the train, the trauma would have been much more extreme. I've seen some deaths from trains, and the initial impact of the train would have done more harm to the body. There were facial injuries consistent with falling forward. And there were marks on and about the head indicating blunt force trauma. The authorities, including forensic officer Mike Dunn, carefully surveyed the surrounding area. We did see a uh, baseball type of cap, and it appeared to have blood on the inside surface of the bill. In addition, there was a pair of wire-rimmed uh, eyeglasses, and one of the earpieces was missing and one of the lenses was out. This didn't look good either. Police are beginning to fear they have a brutal homicide on their hands. As we began to move in a little bit closer, we saw that the victim had been dragged to that spot using just the blue jean material around the cuff at the ankle. There was some tall grass, and if you can picture in your mind something being pulled along through the tall grass. The grass was pushed down and squished, and pressed down by the dragging of the body. It was almost as if the person who did him harm may have been trying to hide the body, but for some reason didn't complete the task. Also in plain view is what appears to be the source of the victim's lethal injuries, a brass and rubber coupling used to link one train car to another. One of those metal ends had spots of what appeared to be blood on it. We make sure that they bag the hands. Any DNA under the nails or any kind of transfer of fluids or anything from the, the perpetrator to the victim is very critical. There might be hairs, there might be fibers from a shirt or sweater that we could find, and we don't want to lose that. While Mike makes a sketch of the scene, police search the young man's body. He had some jewelry, a watch, a necklace, small amount of cash. It was not a robbery. So then again, you go back to how did that person wind up in that area, and what was the relationship between the train and that person? In order to answer that question, investigators must first determine who that person is. 
In this particular case, we did not find any identification on the body. But police do find something in his pocket they hope can help. There was a receipt where some money had been wired from Illinois to Florida. The name on the receipt is a woman's, Wendy. Who is she? And what connection might she have, if any, to the dead young man? Was she involved? Was there someone else with her? Is she safe? Is she a missing person that something may have happened to her? Can she tell them the identity of their murdered male victim? In their search for answers, police tracked the $200 wire receipt back to its point of origin, the Chicago suburb of Woodstock, Illinois, where Officer Kurt Rosenquist has been investigating the disturbing disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Wendy. Most of the juveniles that we've dealt with in Woodstock, they will go away for a few hours, come back late, or they'll be gone for a couple days. But Wendy and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Jesse Howell, have been missing for more than a month. And police fear the pair may have left the state. With kids that age, they can meet with the wrong crowd, they can get rolled for money, they can get into all kinds of trouble. All of which makes him anxious for any news of the missing pair. But the disturbing call from the Florida investigators only fuels Rosenquist's worst fears. They advised me that they were investigating a John Doe unidentified body involving a younger male. Rosenquist sends Jesse Howell's fingerprints and photograph to Marion County Detective Jeff Owens. He said he would hopefully be able to have a positive identification on the unidentified male subject by the end of the day. A teenager is found dead along a railway track in Florida. He has been savagely bludgeoned to death. Investigators trace a receipt found in his pocket to Woodstock, Illinois, where police have been investigating the disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Wendy and her boyfriend, Jesse Howell. The star-crossed lovers had run away together to start a new life. Is Jesse the dead young man? And if he is, what has become of Wendy? Was she involved? And if so, we needed to find her to try to determine what exactly happened to Jesse. Jesse and Wendy had met just months earlier, but the young man knew a good thing when he found it, according to best friend Justin Canary. She was starting to look for, you know, girls that will treat him how he treats them and that kind of stuff, you know. Jesse really, really cared for her and Wendy was very important to him. And a good influence on the young man. She didn't, you know, smoke or drink much, you know. She was like a down-home country girl. She wasn't much of a troublemaker like we were. Trouble was something of a companion for Jesse Howell, who'd already had more than one run-in with the law, much to the dismay of his mother. He was just hanging out with some very unsavory people that had made really bad choices, and he had a habit of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But beneath Jesse's bravado... He was somebody that would do anything for anybody that needed it but he was also somebody that wasn't really world wise. He wasn't street wise and he trusted too quickly. And when he loved somebody, he loved completely. That was certainly the case with Wendy. We knew that he had asked her to marry him and we knew that he loved her a lot and that he really felt this was the one. The young couple secretly got engaged and on February 23rd ran away to start a new life together. He had a few hundred dollars saved up and he bought this old beater car. And at the time he did not have a valid license or insurance, but he had a friend that did. And so the friend decided he and his girlfriend would go with them and the friend drove the car. It was tough. It didn't feel like he was ready to be on his own. I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. We called his friends everywhere we could think of to find out if they knew where he had gone. But Jesse's friends aren't talking, despite what they know. He told me that he was going to Florida. Jesse was my best friend. I was going to go with him, for sure. Then some things came up, and I was like, I can't go right now. You know, go ahead and go, you know, send me a postcard. 
when Wendy's parents discovered their daughter missing, they called police. But even Rosenquist can't get the pair's friends to spill the beans. Because that was going to interrupt this little escapade and adventure that Jesse and uh, Wendy were going on. And they felt that uh, any information that they provided to us that would jeopardize their close-knit friendship. The one thing we always did was we always backed each other's play. So when the missing persons report got filed, Everyone said they didn't know anything. We wanted them to be happy, so we all thought we were looking out, you know, for what's best for Jesse. In the days following, Jesse's mother waited for word from her only son. We got phone calls from him, very few phone calls, but he did call. It seemed the foursome had made it as far as Florida when things started to sour. The other couple. I guess they were getting tired uh, and frustrated with Wendy and Jesse having so many arguments that they decided we're just going to leave them. So when Wendy and Jesse went into the truck stop, the other couple took off in the car. At the time, they thought that leaving them there, they'd be fine. Just three weeks into their trip, and the teen's romantic dreams had given way to hard, cold reality. We were advised by Wendy's parents that Wendy had contacted them, saying that she wanted to come home and asked if they could send some money. It was at that time that Wendy's parents, Western Union, $200 for Wendy and Jesse to pick up so they could take a train or a bus home. Three days later, Jesse called his parents to let them know he was on his way back. We felt so encouraged. He was going to come home and face up to everything and get his life back on track. It felt, it was relief. He realized that he needed more than just what he was capable of doing at that point. We offered to send a train ticket and he said, no, it was okay. And that was the last I heard from him. He told me he loved me and that was it. Though the pair collected the $200 sent to Wendy for their return trip. Checking with Greyhound, and the different train stations, uh, nobody matching their description ordered buses or trains back to the Woodstock area. Now, a week and a half after the teens spoke to their parents, Rosenquest is waiting to learn from Marion County investigators whether the beaten body found by the Florida railway tracks is that of Jesse Howell. About five o'clock that afternoon, Detective Owens gave me a phone call. They had made a positive identification that the unidentified subject was, in fact, Jesse. Kurt Rosenquist prepares for the part of his job he hates the most. Death notifications to family members when it's somebody old or had some health issues is one issue, but when it's a homicide, it makes it even harder. He said that Jess had been found along the railroad tracks in Florida, and that they had identified him. They, had, they were sure it was Jess. The next train going through had seen him, and that he had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. But Becky Howell continues to hold out hope that the murdered teen is somehow not her son. We never got to see him, so it's very hard to have closure. I talked to Patty Lumpkin about it. At the autopsy, crime scene investigators always take a lot of photographs. So we cleaned up the photograph, the neck up, and sent it to Becky and said, is this Jesse? That was very hard. I cried. He was, he was just laying there, and it was him. And that put the nail in it. It was, that's it. That's him. I know there was shock and grief. They never thought that this little adventure road trip that Jesse and Wendy went on was going to end up the way it did. And of course, then they were also very concerned where Wendy was. There was nothing that was going to bring Jess back. And there was no sign of any kind of violence that would have happened to her. There was nothing. And we just knew somehow Jess was dead and Wendy was gone. Lumpkin and Owens step up their search for the missing teen. We weren't sure if Wendy had been kidnapped, abducted, or if she ran away further because of some issues between her and Jesse. So the correlation between her and the crime scene was critical, finding her. 
police use helicopters to scour for miles in all directions, and officers on the ground do a grid search. You're all walking, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the arm's length between you. There's nobody just walking around, because any time you do that, you can trample on evidence and you can destroy your case. But they find nothing at the scene that leads them to the missing girl or the young man's vicious killer. We don't have that person's hair, DNA, fibers, blood, uh, nothing of that other person that was there. We don't have that. Even though we knew that we had the body of Jesse Howe, I think the critical thing at that time was where was Wendy? Marion County, Florida investigators have a double mystery on their hands. Who bludgeoned 19-year-old Jesse Howell to death, then left his body beside a railway track? And what has become of his 16-year-old girlfriend, Wendy? We need to know, is she okay? That's the critical question. Police comb the surrounding area, but find no sign of Wendy or any clues as to the identity of Jesse's killer. It's difficult enough for Jesse's family to deal with this situation, but it's doubly difficult because Wendy's family doesn't know what happened. Nor do investigators. Did a suspect kill Jesse to get Wendy? Did Wendy and Jesse have an out and Wendy somehow hurt Jesse? She may have just fled the scene or left the area. Whether she was on her own, we don't know. She and Jesse were in love with each other. They were committed to each other. And so if she was with someone else, it seemed to me by all things that I had learned that this would be against her will. News of the young man's tragic fate quickly makes its way to the couple's friends. I, I remember hearing the phone ring, my sister talking on the phone, and then she, she, hung, up, she hung off the phone and came downstairs and she told me to sit down. I was like, oh no, you know, something bad happened. And my, then she started crying. You know, she, and all she had to say was, you know, his name. She couldn't even finish the sentence and I knew right away. And Justin's grief is compounded by haunting guilt. There were things I could have done. What if I could have, you know, talked him out of it? What if I, you know, what if I had stopped him from going? I could have saved him, you know? Now investigators are determined to find Jesse's girlfriend. Police and volunteers paper the southeastern United States with posters and distribute flyers along the Florida to Illinois route. We also try to do it through the truckers network because there are a lot of truckers there and they see a lot of things. You know, they're a great avenue of information for you. And police return to the tracks. Might a homeless rail rider have seen something that could help solve the case? Investigators enlist the help of the railway authorities. There's a very well-defined railroad police network in the United States. They have a reputation of being very well in tune with the homeless population. And they start talking to some of the transient people that live there among the tracks in what they call their hobo camps. In the meantime, Florida and Illinois police investigate every sighting of a young woman matching Wendy's description. One of the sightings was that she was living in an abandoned house that one of her old friends had been living in, so we did a search of this vacant house. There were a lot of rumors flying around. You know, this, uh, she's here, she's there. Somebody said she'd been seen at a Marilyn Manson concert. People said, oh, I got a phone call from her. And there were phone calls out in Nevada, out in Colorado that we had to follow up on. Those were all found to be uh, false leads. It was starting to get frustrating as the case dwindled on and information was not coming in. And with a killer on the loose, the Marion County community is growing frustrated too. When you have an unsolved homicide, then the people that live in that area always wonder, is there someone among us? You know, who did this and how could it happen in our area? Then on June 4th, two and a half months after Jesse's body was found, Wendy's parents receive a phone call that promises an end to the parents' harrowing nightmare. The phone rang and Wendy's father answered the phone. The girl was crying, I said she wanted to come home, she's really sorry, I love you. She tells the father she's in Illinois, two hours south of Woodstock in the town of Kankakee. She was at a gas station. She's using a payphone. He asked her, where's this gas station? 
She said she didn't know where the gas station's located. He asked her if there was a phone number on the payphone. She said there's no phone number on this payphone. Then the phone call ended. Although investigators aren't certain the caller was Wendy, they can't afford to take any chances. If she had been held captive, she could have gotten loose, or she may have had that one opportunity to make that phone call. Let's get to her right away. And there is more riding on her rescue. Now maybe we have Wendy as a witness to Jesse's death, and we'll be able to assist Marion County on getting the homicide resolved. But first, they need to find out where that phone call was made. Then, go to that point, see if anybody actually saw a girl fitting Wendy's description there. The next morning, I made arrangements to go down to Kankakee to start searching the gas stations for any witnesses or evidence that she was down there. When Rosenquist finds no one who remembers seeing a girl matching Wendy's description, he begins a systematic search of the town's gas station payphones, looking for ones with no posted number. All of them had the phone number prominently displayed right above the keypad on the telephone, um, except for one. Was this the location from which Wendy made her frantic call? After searching for months, investigators may be close to finding the 16-year-old girlfriend of murdered teenager Jesse Howell. I hope it's true. I really hope it's true. I hope that she's been out there. Her parents received a frantic phone call from a young girl they believe is their daughter, Wendy. Now police have tracked down surveillance video from a gas station where they think the call was made. I started viewing the video and I observed a female subject that physically resembled Wendy. I wasn't going to say 100% that it was her, but it was right at the time frame that the phone calls being made. They show the tape to Wendy's parents. So when Wendy's mom said it was definitely her and there was other family members thinking it was her, we had to treat it as a bona fide sighting. It means we've got another lead that we've got to find Wendy, that the possibility of her being alive is great. Our hopes were really high at that point. This would be wonderful if somehow Wendy had made it back to her home state. And so the feelings at that point were guarded optimism. As a result of this video, we subpoenaed the phone records of Wendy's parents to make sure that this phone call was made from that gas station. When investigators receive the information five days later, their hopes are dashed. It indicated that the phone calls made to Wendy's parents did not come from that phone at the gas station where we had retrieved the video. Uh, it turned out it came from a different gas station and it had the flyers that we had posted. Desperate for news of their daughter, Wendy's parents had added their home number to the posters. Keep in mind that Wendy's parents were extremely stressed through this whole ordeal. Uh, that sometimes can skew a person's view or actually uh, hearing a voice on the phone, things of that nature. Unfortunately, it seemed like this was a very cruel prank or joke being played on Wendy's family. Police believe it was someone pretending to be Wendy who had called the parents from one gas station. While across town, a girl resembling Wendy had coincidentally entered the gas station convenience store. Investigators are shocked by the callousness of the caller. How somebody could be so cruel to make a phone call to a family member, pretend that it's your daughter who's been missing for months. I can't fathom someone who would play a prank like that and get the parents' hopes up. It, in, in my vision, it's disgusting. can imagine putting myself in that place, saying that uh, I've got someone missing, and all of a sudden, they're calling, they're crying, help me, and you have no earthly way of helping them. You can't get to them. You don't know where they're at. Uh, all of a sudden, they're gone again, and then your life is shattered one more time. That's a cruel roller coaster ride. As more months pass without any sign of Wendy, investigators grow increasingly disheartened. 
Our detectives would keep case files and case books. So the books were always in front of you with the, the name of the homicide victim on the spine. So you always had that in front of you somewhere. It's frustrating when you don't solve a case rapidly. And the colder a case may get, the harder it is to solve. It is generally up to you on how to deal with that frustration. Do you shrug and, and give up? Uh, I don't think we ever really give up. Jeff Owens almost became my best friend. I drove them crazy. I drove Patty Lumpkin crazy, I'm sure. I was constantly calling them, constantly calling the offices. We needed to know what was going on. We needed to know if Wendy had been found. My biggest fear for her at this point is that she is dead. And I think that's a possibility because more time goes by and you've not heard anything and you have no clues that are solid. We were hitting a brick wall at that point. A year passes with little progress. Hopes of finding Wendy are beginning to fade. Then, investigators receive a call from the railroad authorities with a very promising lead. Near the town of Jacksonville, we got word that one of the homeless guys mentions, I know a guy named One-Legged Bob who is traveling with a girl and could very well be responsible for the murder of her previous boyfriend. 16-year-old Wendy has been missing for more than a year, and the investigators who've been tirelessly searching for her have run out of leads. You always hope for the best, but as they say, you prepare for the worst. They return to the railway tracks, where they learn that a hobo with a criminal record and the nickname One-Legged Bob is rumored to have been involved in killing Jesse Howell and may know Wendy's whereabouts. This is an extremely important lead for us. We've got to find who One-Legged Bob is, and does he have a girl with him? But how to track an elusive hobo? We did a lot of research on him. We tried to determine what sort of past he had. One nigga Bob did have a criminal record. I think his traveling, his transient uh, life was something that would be a possibility for someone to be involved. Police once again enlist the help of the railway authorities. It was just a matter of weeks before they called me right back and said, Jeff, we found one legged Bob. Do you want to talk to him now? Owens quickly makes his way to Pensacola, Florida to talk to the potential killer. One-legged Bob was your typical, what you might consider a homeless person, kind of scruffy, hadn't shaved in a few days. And he had a prosthetic leg that helped him get around. So for someone who you might consider crippled, he was far from crippled. And well capable of the murder of Jesse Howell. I spent the next seven and a half hours interviewing him about what knowledge he had of this case, how involved he may or may not be. It was exhaustive. Have police finally found the person responsible for Wendy's disappearance and Jesse's murder? Throughout this lengthy interview, he didn't trip. He did not falter. And it's a series of those type of moments that a seasoned investigator will start to get the feeling and the confirmation that I'm dealing with the wrong guy. We really couldn't connect him to her. There was nothing we could do except release him. Investigators are deeply disappointed in their inability to solve either case, and they're not the only ones. For us, it was horrible. It was excruciating, but we knew where our son was. We knew what had happened and where he was, and they had absolutely no idea where their daughter was, and that's got to be horrifying. If I didn't know where one of my daughters was for years, didn't know if she was alive or not, that would, yeah, that would, that would tear me up. I know Wendy's, Wendy's mom uh, held out hope for a, for a long time, but yeah, we all hoped that she was still alive. We all hoped she was gonna make it home. Two years after Jesse's murder and Wendy's disappearance, Patty Lumpkin is in Quantico, Virginia, attending a coveted three-month training program with the FBI. The privilege of that was great because less than 1% 
of law enforcement in the United States have that opportunity to attend that academy. Little does she know that her effort to become a better cop will blow her unsolved homicide case wide open. Lumpkin hears from officers attending the course about a murderer on the loose in Texas. I became aware that they were looking for someone that was dubbed the railway killer, the angel of death. He was killing people and either leaving them near the railroad or he was killing them at homes or locations that were close to the railroad. The FBI believes the railway killer's real name is Angel Resendez, charged years earlier for a rash of burglaries across the U.S. But more recently, police had matched his fingerprint to one of a slew of murders, all with the same grisly signature. Most of the victims were bludgeoned to death. It was blunt force trauma. That M.O. is so strikingly similar to that of Jesse's ruthless killer, Lumpkin has the growing sense she's onto something. They're looking for him out in the West. We're in the South, but remembering that the possibility of the mobility of the train, you know, what's the chance? Could Resendez be the man for whom they've been desperately searching for years? Lumpkin and Owens quickly head to Texas, the site of the railway killer's most recent attacks. They were having a meeting to discuss the possibility that this person of interest was involved in a serial crime spree around the country. And he's a difficult killer to catch, according to profiler Mark Young. We knew Angel Resendez was a person that rode the rails across the country. We were worried about where he was going to strike next. So we had made the decision early on that he needed to be made a top 10 fugitive. You know, these millions of eyes from the public would tell us something. The strategy works, and Resendez is apprehended along the Mexico-Texas border. He is charged and convicted of one gruesome killing, and he's the number one suspect in dozens of others. He was one of the most vile, um, like evil persons that I had dealt with. It was like every time you turn around, here's another murder. Might Jesse Howells be one of them? Was Resendez responsible for Jesse's death and Wendy's disappearance? Owen and Lumpkin want to interview him and find out. So to be able to talk to him in person, uh, you can sit one-on-one -on -one with him and you can look him in the eye and hope that he will give you that information. But there's a problem, and it's a big one. The attorneys representing him at the time in Texas stopped us. They wanted to protect their client from talking. And any defense attorney who represents a criminal will generally tell the person, stop talking to law enforcement. And with Resendez on death row, the investigators know they're quickly running out of time. The state of Texas historically has a pretty fast moving execution rate. So we were concerned that Resendez would be put to death before we resolved our case. That's when Lumpkin and Owens hit upon an idea. We contacted some folks in Houston and asked them what opportunity we might have to communicate with Resendez in jail by letter. He gravitated towards females more than he did the males from what the detectives out there were telling us. So I wrote the letter. We treated him uh, respectfully in the way we wrote the letter. We even referred to him as senor instead of mister, because that's, that's appropriate for someone from Mexico. We just laid it out. We have a case that's open where we have a young man that was killed. He was traveling with his girlfriend, and we never found her. And we just bluntly asked him, was he involved in the cases? Did he know what happened? And much to our surprise, he responded. Marion County Police are in a hurry to meet with Angel Resendez, the man they believe is responsible for the Florida murder of Jesse Howell and the disappearance of his girlfriend, Wendy. He was on a path to a death penalty in Texas. We didn't have a lot of time. Given the court order preventing them from meeting with the so-called railway killer, investigators write Resendez, hoping he'll come clean on the crime and much to our surprise, he responded by saying he knew all about it. As a matter of fact, 
he was quick to admit that he was the one responsible for killing Jesse. It is a shocking admission. Can they trust Resendez to be telling them the truth? There have been cases in the past where people falsely confess to a crime. One of the ways to prevent that is not to release all information. One of the most crucial and important aspects of this case was that we had never talked about the murder weapon. Can Angel Resendez provide police with the information only the killer could know? He described the brake coupling that he had hit Jesse in the head with. He knew that. We knew absolutely at that point we hit the target. The investigators are elated. Though they have yet to meet Resendez face to face, they are confident they have found Jesse's killer. But what about Wendy? Does he know what happened to her? We need to be able to sit down one on one with him to talk with him and find out, is he going to talk to us? Is he going to tell us what happened? To be certain he's not lying to them, the investigators are prepared to offer Resendez a deal. But first, the heartbreaking task of asking Wendy and Jesse's parents to agree to it. At that point, we went to the families and we said, may we give this killer immunity from prosecution in Florida if he agrees to talk to us? It is not an easy question to ask a family, uh, OK, we're going to give this person a pass if they tell us what happened. But the long and short of that was that he was going to be executed in Texas. And to be able to give some closure, they agreed to that. To investigators' relief, so does Angel Resendez. As twisted as it may sound, he might have been proud of some of what he did. It was another veiled attempt to earn a little more infamy, make himself feel famous. Uh, would we take advantage of that to get him to talk? Sure we would. Lumpkin and Owens head to death row in Texas for one of the most difficult interviews of their careers. Pressure was great because we knew that this was our one shot. If we didn't do it right, we would never know what happened. The entire case is basically hinging on what he's able to provide. When we get to the prison, we see him coming down the hallway. He has a waist belt on that's an electric shock belt, and he's chained to the belt. All for what appears to be just a regular guy. He's just a a mild-mannered person, but remembering, too, that a psychopath or a sociopath doesn't have any feeling. I mean, he had dead eyes. He had no feeling in that body. He didn't care about anything. Resendez tells investigators that he was heading south to find work when he met the runaway couple on a grain car. When the freight train stopped and Jesse got off to smoke a cigarette, Resendez told us that he killed Jesse with a piece of the train coupling. And that Wendy was, I believe, asleep on the train when this took place. And then when they went down the road further, somehow he talked Wendy into getting off the train. He claims he strangled Wendy to death, then dragged her lifeless body into the bushes. He talked about covering her body with a army style jacket. He talked about a book that she had been carrying in her backpack. Uh, you got to remember this was three and a half years prior to this interview and he so vividly recalled so many of these details it was sort of spooky. But is he simply leading on the investigators? There was a great chance that even though Resendez told us where he left Jesse that he was lying about Wendy. There's only one way to find out. While we were sitting there during our interview with Resendez, we asked him, would he draw us a more detailed map? On the map, he drew where the bodies were. He drew where Wendy's body was. After confessing that he'd murdered Jesse Howell and his girlfriend, Wendy, Angel Resendez, known as the Railway Killer, has drawn police a map of what he claims is the location of the 16-year-old girl's body. But investigators are leery. We didn't know if it was going to lead to us discovering her remains. And not only could he be lying, but he could maybe not know exactly where he did leave her. 
three and a half years after Wendy went missing, police returned to the railway tracks in search of her body. Using Resendez's map, investigators travel an hour's drive south from the site of Jesse Howell's murder. We had gone down the tracks a pretty good distance when you could see, based on the description that Resendez had provided um, of this big cluster of trees like a canopy, and there was a white farmhouse close by. And we had a big team ready on the ground, and we had some very uh, highly trained dogs to help us. Very shortly after the dogs began their search that they found a campsite. During the interview at Death Row, Resendez talked about the book. The book was there. We talked about the jacket, the big heavy army style overcoat. It was there. All of these things were there. And police don't have to dig very deep to find Wendy's body. It does break your heart because you know that she is somebody's loved one. She's not just a young girl. She's somebody's loved one. She had a future. Now she doesn't have a future. So it's not a good conclusion, but it's the right conclusion to find for the family. We were grateful for the relief that Wendy's parents would be able to go through now. We knew they would finally be able to grieve their daughter and move on with their lives. When Wendy ran away, um, she had a small engagement ring and she had a Winnie the Pooh wristwatch. Um, during the excavation of the remains and the processing of the crime scene, the ring and a Winnie the Pooh watch were located and um, I brought those back to Woodstock and gave those to Wendy's parents. Jesse had this, it was just a little like pewter cross that he wore all the time. And um, it was actually on, on his body when, 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 they, when he was found dead. And his, his mom gave it to me and I still have it to this day. And it's just one of those small reminders, you know, of, you know, to, to be aware of the decisions I make in my life. There will never be closure. There's no such thing as closure. It's always going to hurt. Every March 23rd, I'm going to cry. But it's huge to know that it's done so that you can at least say it's done and move on. In the years following, federal agents continue their investigation into the railway killer. They discover a bloody trail of no less than 15 brutal murders throughout the United States. Angel Resendez is executed in Texas by lethal injection. He made it very clear during my conversation with him that he deserved to die. My reaction to Resendez being put to death was good. I think he got the justice that he wanted. I'm satisfied that he is gone and he will no longer hurt anybody. He got what he deserved. Patty Lumpkin was promoted to Bureau Chief of the Marion County Sheriff's Office, and Lieutenant Jeff Owens was given a Medal of Commendation for his work on the case. For more information, go to ownca.oprah.com slash murder she solved.